Hi all, we are live on Facebook as well as we have with the Zoom group chat and welcome to everyone. There are two more people waiting on the waiting room, so let me admit them. And then we are starting. We have uh, the very dynamic lady here, Miss Preeti Vikram. And sorry for starting 20 minutes late. There were huge network issue, which tells about technology. The technology fails at times. And uh, we were still letting people in and there are plenty of people who still haven't joined. So welcome to you, Ms. Preeti uh, Vikram. And we had the pleasure to introduce Ms. Preeti. Her topic is like uh, bridging the gap through play and play plays a very integral part of the kindergarten curriculum as well as primary, of course. She's a founder director of LIFE, Leadership Initiative for Education, Master Franchisee for Podar Education Network, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Preeti Vikram is a very committed educator and passionate parenting coach, leadership mentor, and a broad champion. She constantly thrives to make a difference in the lives of children and consequently the world at large. Preeti Vikram has been an educationist for last 16 years. She has been associated with Podar Education Network, uh, providing uh, the franchisee to Karnataka, AP and Telangana, and she is currently heading 56 centers. That's really amazing. She has been the territory head for ECA. She has been a member of the Board of Studies for the MSc Early Childhood Early Program uh, of Srimati uh, VHD Home Science College. Uh, Preeti is a leadership mentor and founder director of LIFE, as I already told you, which is a dynamic initiative that focuses on education leadership and organized national cultures. She has had the opportunity to create and organize a conference on STEAM for Department of uh, School Education of MP, where she had the honor of sharing the stage with ex-Chief Minister Shri Kamal Nath. Congratulations for that. Her, proper presenta her, her paper presentation on, on humor and uh, uh, superhero play, which we have already seen it before, have been uh, published in multiple forums. She has presented at the NAYC uh, uh, conference 2014 in Dallas and in 2016 at Los Angeles. Um, Ms. Preeti had the privilege of being invited to the LEGO India conference in 2018 at, uh, at Denmark. She has received the award of Times Power Woman for, a contribution, for the contribution in the field of early childhood education. So warm welcome to you, Preeti. And I think I don't have my glasses. So here and there, I've been doing the goof ups and reading your profile, but your profile is beautiful and rich and it's really good. And we are very, very honored to have you on the uh, Green Talk, the Green Ed Talk session two. So there, uh, Preeti, over to you. Please take Thank over you. the session. And people keep chatting to us, keep writing the messages to us on Zoom group chat after Preeti ma'am uh, finishes her talk. And you can all, we're also on live, uh, live, live on Facebook. So you can write there and we can answer questions after Preeti finishes the talk. So over to you, Ms. Preeti Vikram. Thank you so much for having me here. I think it's a pleasure uh, to always address you and uh, uh, the fantastic community that you build. School, Bangalore, and Bangalore School. So I'm um, very happy to be sharing about something that's so close to my heart. I request all the other participants to please mute yourself, otherwise there will be disturbance. Great, thanks so much. Uh, like I was saying, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be talking about play, and it's uh, I'm sure a pleasure for you to listen to me talk about play than listen to me. Uh, listen to my profile being read out to you, which seemed quite long when she was reading it out. Um, play presently in most schools is a bad word. It's that four letter word which educators and parents think is a bad word. And that is so unfortunate because the benefits of play is something that cannot be uh, stressed on enough, right? So, um, why do we need play? So what I'm planning to do today is we'll talk a little bit about why play is important. We'll look at how it looks in an academic setting or in our schools and at our homes. And uh, maybe we get to play a little bit together, right? So uh, anytime you need to ask anything, you can 
go to the option of the participants button and there is something called as raise hand. Do raise your hand, it will come up. And if I'm able to answer that right then and there, I'd like to answer that. Otherwise we can come back to it at the end and, and uh, you know, the moderator can help me also, um, you know, project this. Am I audible? I hope uh, my voice is clear enough. Uh, yes. 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 I think great. Okay, so I'm going. I'm just going to continue in that case. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I request you to make me a co-host so I'm able to share my screen. Can you make me a co-host so I'm able to share my screen? I'd like to show a few things while I speak. So here is where play is important. Even when you're faced with a challenge like this, if you believe that you're playing, it helps you stay in a good mood. So I'm just going to ask Usha once again, can you make me a co-host? Uh, yeah, Preetiji, one minute. Done, done, got it now. You made me the co-host. Yeah. So there you go. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. One of my favoriteest quotes from Piaget is that play is the work of childhood. I think that many of us forget that when we play, there's so much learning that takes place. There's so much of uh, interaction and uh, I think overall development that takes place when we are playing. And so I've seen that many parents and many teachers, um, for example, will think of play as the opposite of work. And so this quote is important for us because it reminds us that play is the work of childhood, right? Um, so, so it's like if when your child comes home with say, for example, homework or if uh, in the classroom, you see children are engaged in some activity, you should never say something like, now stop playing, it's time to do your homework. I mean, homework is something that, that for parents, it's considered such a big task, right? So I think we all need to shift from the thought that play is the opposite of work and think of play as work itself of children. So, um, so that's the first thing that, uh, that I would like to share with you. And if we all agree that this is the definition of play, then we can move forward, right? Um, Definitely power of play we will be talking about and how it looks in the early childhood setting. I'd like to talk a little bit about brain development and why play is so important for brain development. So this picture, if you see, um, and if you uh, look at the text that I have, it says that the brain of a kindergarten has 1,000 trillion synapses, about twice as many as her pediatricians. What this means is that this particular child here is having more brain cells than the pediatrician. Does that mean that this child is smarter than the pediatrician? No, it means that there is so much that a brain offers and we are able to develop that brain. It means that as we grow older, whatever parts of the brain we are not using gets pruned away, it gets removed, right? So when, when we're looking at a child, we have a whole clean slate to work on. And so when this child does not get enough stimulation, does not get enough uh, activities to keep the brain occupied, that means that all senses are not being used, this child, unfortunately, the parts of the brain that are not being used gets eroded. And so by the time the child grows up, the genius is not there anymore. So as kindergarten teachers or as parents of young children, we need to remember that children are 
a beautiful gift to us and there is a genius in every child that's left to us to bring out. And so play is important here because we are able to activate many parts of the brain at one time with different forms of play, right? Um, a little bit more gyan about the brain, right? Um, so there are four of these uh, uh, neurotransmitters and I would, I would like to talk about each of these neurotransmitters a little bit. Uh, so the first one is endorphins. Now endorphins are uh, the hormone in the body that helps to cope with pain that comes from exercising. So when, say for example, you've gone on a run, uh, the body wants to make you feel good about having gone on the run or having gone for the jog. So which is why endorphins are released to make you feel really nice about yourself. So when you exercise, there is this hormone that gets released into the body that makes you happy, that makes you satisfied, right? So that's the first hormone that I want you to remember. The next one is dopamine. Dopamine is, um, imagine you've done something good, whether it's at office or at home, um, you get appreciated. Do you feel nice about it? Yes. So dopamine is released in the body when you, what you've done is appreciated or when you're appreciated, right? Um, the third hormone is serotonin. Now serotonin is released into the body when, um, I'm sorry, serotonin is released into the body when uh, you go beyond yourself, beyond the call of duty. You transcend yourself. That means, say you give alms to the poor or you help out a friend without uh, expecting anything in return. So even without the gratitude that they've expressed, you feel nice. So when you do a good deed, you start feeling nice. And that's when serotonin is released, right? And the final hormone that we have is oxytocin, right? Oxytocin is released in the body when there is, some amount of physical contact, say you hug somebody or uh, you hold hands, that's when oxytocin is released in the body, right? And these are the four hormones that are responsible for your brain to release signals that you are happy, okay? So if a child has to be happy, um, these four, one of these four hormones have to get released in the brain. I hope I've been simple and clear enough of because there's a lot of biology, uh, biochemistry that goes into this, which I'm not going to get into. Um, so why are we talking about so much of brain development and what goes on in the brain, right? Now, if you look at it, these four hormones, how do they get released? And what are some of the things that we can do to ensure that these are getting released? Endorphins, children need movement. Children need a lot of movement. And so in case you're asking your child to sit quietly in one place, this hormone is limited. Let's take a classroom, for example. If the classroom is really quiet and the children are sitting quietly, I get scared because that means that the children are not happy there. There is no endorphin being released because there is no movement happening, right? Let's look at serotonin. Are we giving children enough opportunities to do some work which is good? Are we giving them opportunities to help out a friend? The minute the child is getting up from their seat or uh, going out of the way, we say, don't, you're disturbing the class, right? So where are the chances for a child to get serotonin, that is to do something bigger and larger than, than themselves? Now let's look at oxytocin. Uh, unfortunately, today, there is so much stigma attached to adults hugging and carrying children, especially men in the early childhood settings. I know that there are some uh, unfortunate incidents that have caused that, but then children need oxytocin. So can the teacher or as the adult at home, can you give the child enough contact? They need to feel you. They need to hug you. They need to be able to hold your hand while doing something. Another way that oxytocin gets released in the body is through rough and tumble play. Now, rough and tumble play is when two children are engaged in, um, in physically playing together. Have you seen children? They like to wrestle. They like to hold hands and kind of push each other, pull each other. They like to do all of that. And that's rough and tumble play. This is a very important aspect of play that all children need to learn. Because when there is rough and tumble play, uh, children learn to understand, of course, there's oxytocin being produced, but they also learn to understand that um, 
I can push this child so much before he can get hurt. So they learn to understand the non-verbal cues of another person being, um, uh, you know, hurt or uh, you know how much they can take. These are very important cues that children have to develop and they need to learn how to access these. Because if they don't get this, later when they're grown up, they will hurt others because they don't understand when to stop. You understand? So, uh, you know, your cases of domestic abuse will be high with a child who, for example, has not had enough rough and tumble play as a child. So it's important that we give rough and tumble play, but I digress. Coming back to the four hormones, how are we giving dopamine to the children? How are we ensuring there is enough dopamine? Dopamine is, like I said, released when uh, children are appreciated for something that they have done. So are you appreciating children enough or are you catching children only when they are making mistakes? Now, dopamine also is released when you have done something and there is a sense of achievement, that eureka moment. Right. I don't know how many of you know um, uh, the story of Archimedes. Um, I'd like to tell the story if you're OK. So Archimedes, if uh, if there are any science people here, you would uh, you can help me out if I'm getting the words wrong. Um, Archimedes, uh, he discovered the principle of buoyancy. Now, buoyancy is uh, in terms of how much water gets replaced when an object is in, uh, placed in water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when he was working on this principle for a long time, right? And one day he was in his bathtub, he's immersed in water. He steps into his bathtub, he immerses himself into the water and the water overflows. And that's when it hit him. And he, he, it struck him that this is what buoyancy is. And so that power of the Eureka moment was so great that he just got up and ran out onto the streets saying, Eureka, Eureka. Of course he was, jailed for doing so and they didn't understand the power of this but i'm saying that eureka moment is so important for a child and they 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 get the the dopamine from those small achievements that they have now how can play help in releasing these four four hormones and in the absence of play what happens right so if you look at it when children engage in meaningful play, that means either they are having role play, they have uh, thought of, okay, this is the rules of the game. This is how we are going to do. You usually see one child will take charge. They will say, okay, now we're going to do this. Later, we're going to do this. So children will play by themselves. So when they are having this kind of a meaningful play, all four hormones will get released at some doses. Right? And that's a very healthy way of staying happy. In the absence of play and being able to experience these four, four hormones, we start to look for ways of, our body will start to look for ways of how these hormones can get released. Have you observed when your mobile thinks that the notification comes for a chat or an SMS or a, or a, a WhatsApp or a Facebook message, you get the notification, you immediately want to look at it. You know why? That's dopamine. That's dopamine coming into your body because that thing, that small notification that comes actually is an acknowledgement of you, right? And so uh, a lot of these, when it starts happening and the child is also addicted to dopamine because let me tell you, dopamine is the drug that's available in most of the narcotic drugs that are in the market today, right? So dopamine is a bit addictive. And so even as adults, we get, we tend to want to get appreciation from others. If we do not have enough of the other three hormones, our dependency on dopamine is greater. So it's important that we give children enough opportunity to play, move around so endorphins get released. Um, then we need to hug them, give them enough opportunities to touch and feel so that uh, oxytocin gets released. We need to give them challenges which they can overcome and feel greater than themselves. So serotonin gets released. We also need to ensure that children are able to play and feel a sense of achievement through which you have dopamine getting released. So we know that brain development is happening in young children. We know that these hormones are getting released in the children's brain. So there is no reason why we should say no to children playing, right? 
Now, um, we've spoken enough about the brain. I'd like to talk a little bit about the body to you, uh, which is, uh, I'm just going to go back to my slides and talk a little bit about the body. Uh, before that, a little comic relief. I don't know if you've seen this cartoon, but I find this so appropriate. It says that, can you play with him for a while because his battery has died? And this is so true to today's parents. It's so unfortunate, but this is true. And so as educators and the parents who are uh, intentional, it becomes our responsibility to ensure that children are having enough play and not play on gadgets alone, right? Um, okay, moving forward. Any questions still now about the brain and the brain development or we'll move on to uh, development of the human body and then we'll come back to questions and we are not able to see your it's a you blast. can't yeah you can't you see, see the you can't see the ppt yeah no ma'am no i can see basically yeah i can see how many of you can see it i can see too i can as well see yeah the the picture now that was being shared yeah earlier it was not there but now earlier, i can see. yeah when she was talking of course there was no presentation and yeah, that I know, but now uh, I'm uh, maybe some bandwidth uh, issue from my no, end. Now, actually, today everybody is facing a. I'm just getting messages and calls. So you can even log in on Facebook and see it. You can do that. But you can post your questions here on Zoom group chat or on the Facebook comments. Yeah, thank you. I think if you have any questions, you can ask her. Otherwise, she'll proceed. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions which are non-technical because I'm not of a, much of a technology person myself. I can just this. Okay, so moving on to uh, learning about the body, uh, the human body, how is it made? I don't know if parents are told this when the child is born, but we as educators are told this right when we learn about child development. So I felt it's important that we do talk about this a little bit because it's important that everybody understand how a body develops. Like there are two, uh, uh, as you can see, principles that govern how the body grows, right? One is cephalocaudal and the other one is proximodistal. Now cephalocaudal means that development happens from head to toe. Proximodistal means that development happens from inside to outside. Now, what does that mean? Cephalocaudal means my head is going to develop first before the development of the rest of the body happens. So if you see young babies, right, when, when they're born, the first thing that you will see is their ability to move their head. That's the first thing that happens. The next thing that ha happens is their neck. Can they hold their neck? Uh, uh, you know, stiff. And that's after that only you will see the back muscles developing where they're able to sit up, roll over. Only after that is your legs and everything else developing. Proximodus still uh, says that all development will start from inside and then it will move into the arms and the legs, right? So from inside to outside. So if you see a two-year-old, how would they catch a ball? They wouldn't catch it like this. They would use their body to catch a ball, right? Now, why is that? They are still at the age where the body is developing. It's still at the inside part of it. The outside is yet to get developed, right? So knowing that this is how a body develops, can we make two-year-olds hold a pencil, right? You have to understand that my fingers are the last ones to develop. So it's important that we have to ensure children's development is understood by the adult who is caring for that child. The other thing about, uh, I want to show you another part about, um, okay, I probably shared the wrong screen. Okay. So the next thing we need to know about is crossing of the midline. If you see, young children are not able to, uh, if, you, if you've placed, say, colors in front of them and yellow is on the right side and, uh, the, say, green color is on their left side, if you ask the child to pick up and give you the color which is on their left side and they're using their right, 
right hand. They will not cross the midline and pick up that color. They will use their left hand, pick up the color, get to the right hand, and then they will pass it on to you. Now, this is because at this age, they're still not able to cross the midline, right? Imagine a young child who goes into first standard. A lot of activities that children take up require crossing of the midline, right? To be able to help. When you're writing, you start from the left and you move to the right. Okay, somebody's audio is on, so request you to mute yourself. Or you can present with me. I'm happy to do so. I hear a lovely child's voice. Uh, okay. So crossing the midline activities is something you need to give. What can you give for children to cross the midline? Right? Climbing. Do you know climbing activities? It's needed for children because they're using their left hand and then they're moving their right leg. Climbing helps cross the midline. Right? Crawling. Have you seen how children crawl? They will put left leg, right hand, right leg, left hand. So they, they keep alternating between the hands and the legs. I have a lot of parents who were, tell me that, ma'am, my child is so brilliant. My child did not crawl only. He sat and then he started walking. And then I go, oh my God, you know, really if the child hasn't crawled, that means there hasn't been enough midline crossing. And that that is a very big necessity for children to have. So allow children to play. How many of us as children have climbed trees? Many of us, right? Unfortunately, today's children don't have trees to climb on. It's so sad. So even the, if there are trees, there is somebody who's standing. If the child is even attempting to climb a tree, somebody's standing. Careful, careful, careful. You can get. You might get a scratch. No? So you're constantly helicoptering around that child again and again. So not allowing the child to have the joy of climbing. So then the child will say, enough of this. Let me just forget it. No? So... Are we allowing children enough opportunities to cross the midline? So when you're planning for play at home or at school, it's important to know whether you this is something you have considered. Have you given in, enough importance to crossing the midline? Now, one more thing about the body. Um, okay, so we talk about the seven senses, right? How many of you know that we, we have senses? And how many senses do you think we have? Now, typically, when I ask this in um, uh, a room full of uh, uh, people, when, and I, I, this is very new to me talking to people online. So when we do this and I have people sitting in the room, they tell me that we all have five senses. And the five senses would be touch, taste, hear, see, and smell. Right, these are the five senses we have. But I just put up a slide that we have seven senses. Now, what are the other two senses? And how can we ensure that we are developing not just five senses in the child, we need to develop all seven in the children, right? The other two senses, one is the vestibular sense. I'm going to put up the screen so that you're able to see this. And I'm, I'm talking. It's the vestibular sense and the proprioceptive sense. Now, proprioceptive sense is nothing but having an understanding of where your head is in relationship with your body. Now, this is very important. Think about it. If you didn't know where your head is, uh, close your eyes and try to touch your nose. Do you know where your nose is? Yeah, you know that, right? That means your proprioceptive sense is working. And so children need to know where the, their head is in relationship to the rest of their body, right? The vestibular sense, I have turned off the PPT for now, I will bring it back on. Um, so the vestibular sense is the sense of balance, is the sense of if I'm able to walk this way, uh, will I reach there? And, and uh, how do I maintain my sense of balance? So these are two senses that are extremely important, again, in the early years. Now tell me, how do children get these two senses? They will get it through play, through physical play. They should be able to run, jump. They have to be able to do all activities which will allow them to develop these two senses, apart from the first five senses as well. Now, Montessori said that children are sensorial learners. They learn best through 
uh, uh, through sensory experiences and something that more than a couple of senses are involved in that activity, that concept, the child will remember forever, right? So you need to have, when you're planning for play with the children, with, with uh, uh, whether it's at home or at school, how many senses are we introducing in this particular thing, right? So, uh, We've spoken quite a bit now about the brain and the body. So next, I'd like to talk to you all a little bit more on what play means and what it looks like. This I have borrowed from the Lego Foundation's uh, publication. Um, this is what play is. It's meaningful, it's joyful, it's socially interactive, it's actively engaging, it's iterative. Now, what does this mean? I hope you're able to see uh, the PPT. You were able to see, now I've just turned it off. I will put it back on uh, if you would like, because I know that people um, would want to make a note of it if necessary. What this means is any activity that you play has to be meaningful it has to be contextual it when when we say meaningful right i i remember that um, there are many teachers who will bring in these wonderful publications but they're not indian for example and they will have a mention of the avocado the you know you, you, introduction of the avocado for introducing the letter a it's not meaningful to an indian child why because they haven't seen an avocado Right? And meaningful because when a child comes into the classroom or when a child is at home, if you were to talk about, say, apple, is that the first time the child has seen an apple? Just because you decided to teach about an apple on a particular day, is that the only time the child has seen, an, or, uh, seen or experienced an apple? No. So then why do teachers go like, this is a apple, apple, bolo beta, apple, you know, so it, it seems ridiculous that we are still continuing to teach this way, you know, children, allow them to explore it, keep the apple in the classroom or at home, allow them and see what they are doing, are they looking at it, are they smelling it, young children, if you see, they will pick something up, first thing they will do is put it in their mouth, because at that time, it's the the taste sense which is still developing and they're really curious to understand that sense. So how can we include all five and the plus two senses, the seven senses while we are planning and make it meaningful to a child, right? It has to be contextual and the child has to be able to understand from a very realistic point of view. And this is something that again, I'd like to quote Montessori that she believed that all activities that children do should be based on reality. So for example, if you're introducing a, say um, a scissor in the classroom, will you give a plastic scissor or a scissor which is not sharp? No. Montessori believes that you give a scissor which is sharp, but also give the children enough advice on how to use it, enough rules on how to use it. Because if you give a fake scissor, the child is going to go out of your space and think that the rest of the scissors in the world are also not sharp. And you are putting the child in danger. So all activities that you plan have to be contextual. It has to be as real as possible, right? Um, so that's the part about meaningful. The next thing about play is that it's joyful. Uh, now, uh, when I was doing my research on humor, there was uh, this uh, bit of statistics that I got. It said that children on average in a day laugh 200 times okay as adults any guesses how many times we laugh average is just six times and that's really sad i mean just six times what happened to all of us why have we stopped laughing why is there no humor in our lives that's because we don't play enough we do not play enough as adults, right? And if you see children who are playing, have you ever seen children who are upset while playing? Even if they're upset, they learn to control their emotions. They learn to understand their emotions and overcome the negative emotions and move into positivity, right? So 
all play is joyful and the minute it's not joyful it's not play it's a structured activity given by an adult i hope you are able to understand the difference between this the next thing about play is that it's socially interactive it means that there is a transaction involved right it means that i i i have to uh, behave in a certain way in this particular group i have to behave like this in this group so the child understands social interaction so much better the next thing about play is that it's actively engaging now if you see children who are watching a lot of screens a lot uh, they're spending a lot of time on screens right it's not actively engaging because what they're doing is if you put on say a cartoon if you put on rhymes they're only watching it and then consuming it there isn't any active engagement there is no interaction right so you need to understand that if we have to plan for children the activities have to be engaging so in a classroom the teacher has come prepared with beautiful story she is telling the story because she has attended a story telling workshop and they said use vo uh, voice modulation use props use all these things so she says oh uh, the three little pigs built a beautiful house etc etc so she is saying the story with so much of joy right but for a child unless he or she is able to contribute to that story there is no interaction there is no engagement you understand so you should have the children contribute to whatever you are doing you have planned for the activity that is the third thing about play uh, fourth thing i'm sorry it has to be actively engaging and finally play has to be iterative now what does iterative mean it means that have you seen children who have learned something they will keep repeating the same behavior over and over again because they they've experienced eureka they've experienced that they can do it that sense of achievement so they will keep playing it so the opportunity to play iterative means to keep repeating it opportunities for doing it again and again so are we ensuring that it's available for children because once we provide that learning for children they should be able to practice it again and again they should they sh because that's when they are able to master that skill so these are the five things you need to keep in mind when you're planning your curriculum either at home or at school when you're planning play anything right um so these were two things uh, i'm sorry these were uh, five important principles that i wanted you to keep in mind if we have any questions now or we can move on there is a person who uh, appreciated your talk so she's ha, a, very um, happy with the talk so i can read her comment uh, her comment says um, this is um, sheetal jetty sheetal jetty says amazing points of comments there's a lot of shortage of all these neurotransmitters in special need children and we know developmentally appropriate play is absent in them so there's no question as such thank you so much for sharing that sheetal you're right and i think that um, unfortunately we have we most often speak about children who are growing neurotypically and so we uh, you know many of us do not have the understanding thing about children who are non neurotypical so thank you for bringing that up she uh, like she has pointed out these neurotransmitters these hormones that are getting released there is some inconsistency in them in children with special needs so we really need to work hard with uh, children who don't have it being naturally produced thank you for bringing that up sheetal ah now um usha we have time for another 15 20 minutes Yes, yes, you have, and there are people. There are about sixty participants totally. Many of them were not able to log into Zoom, so we have got a lot of people on the Facebook. Yeah, continue. Great. Okay, so I know that um, the reason why we don't have enough time for play, whether it's at home or at school, is because there is so much focus on academics, right? I think all of you will agree with me that if if we feel 
that the child is playing too much, it means that their academics is going to take a toll. Yeah, do you agree with me? Yes, ma'am. You will not agree because I've been talking about play. But generally, if you're honest to yourself, like I would, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of parents and teachers think, they believe that the more a child is playing, the more the academics is getting affected. Now, why should the two be mutually exclusive? Why can't we marry the two? Your academics can be learned very comfortably through play. Now, in early childhood, any form of play is leading to learning. And let me be very honest with you, even without us adults teaching them, children will lead, learn to read, they will learn to write, they will learn to count. They don't need you and me. Let's be very clear about that. We are only facilitating that process. Okay, tell me this, when children are really young, like say maybe one and a half also, even when they're pre-verbal, right? At this stage, you break a chocolate into two pieces. One one is slightly smaller and one is slightly bigger. Which half or which piece will a child choose? The smaller one or the bigger one? Definitely the bigger one. Because children are smart. They're, they're able to perceive which is bigger. This is nothing but math. This is nothing but numeracy that they have. It's already coded. We are born with a skill to learn numbers. But uh, by the time we reach college most of us hate math because we have the joy of math has been taken away through education <laughs> so it's unfortunate that happens to education so my my sincere request is let's try and bring play back into our academics because it will make academics all of the five things it will make it meaningful it will make it joyful it will make it socially interactive you realize the power of engagement right so these are the things that we need to keep in mind while we are planning for a session let's look at some small examples um pre-reading skills what is the first step of being able to read it's being able to recognize right so if i need to get the child ready to be recognizing what are some activities i can do with my child if you see the first one i put up on this slide is i spy with my little eye i don't know if you've seen this game let's play this i want all of you to turn on your cameras everybody in the zoom call please turn on your camera so i can see you please turn on your cameras keep your audio muted and turn on your camera what we are going to do is called a I spy with my little eye game. So what you uh, what I'm going to do is something that you can repeat with your children. I spy with my little eye something blue. Can you all find something blue in your rooms that you're sitting and show it to the camera quickly now? Find something blue. My jeans. My jeans is in blue color. Your jeans is in blue color? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. What else is blue? I can see somebody wearing a blue kurta already, so she's sorted. Oh, I, I'm wearing blue with a blue pen. Ah, blue pen. Husband, even he's wearing blue color t shirt <laughs> <laughs> Your husband's wearing blue color t shirt Fantastic. What yeah. I have a pen which is blue. Pen which One is more. Blue. Very nice. Sir, I can't. I have a hair clip, ma'am. Hair clip that's blue, okay, super. What else? Fantastic, okay. I don't know what that is. I can see something blue being flashed on the screen. So fantastic. Um, so I, I can see that the minute I asked you to do this, number one, thank you for turning on your cameras. I was able to see that you're all smiling, right? The minute we started playing, I can see that we are all smiling. So that's that's joyful and it's engaging and everybody wants to share i have this blue i have this blue right but here in the context of learning to read the first activity that the first step to reading is to be able to label things is to be able to recognize this because only if i'm able to have the skill of recognizing I will know that the letter A stands for a sound. It stands for something that is symbolic. This word apple, I have 
have to be able to recognize this word. I need to be able to, in my head, think of the picture of an apple and then connect the two and then read it aloud. You understand? This is what reading takes. So playing games like I spy with my little eye will help with recognition. And if somebody says that there is no academics in this, please give them the gyan that I just gave you, right? So you need to play games like this. Another a version of this I, I like also is I hear with my little ear a whirring noise. Now, of course, I can't do this with all of you. Your audios are muted. But I, when I do that in the classroom, children will look around. They, some of them will even close their eyes. They'll see what is it that they can hear. Yeah. And what is a whirring noise? And so it could be the fan. It could be the AC. It could be uh, somebody outside using a spray could be anything so i spy and i hear are all fantastic games that gets children to be more focused and it is improving their pre-reading skills okay writing i know that this is something that every parent every educator struggles with right when especially and i'm talking specifically about a child because that's what I, uh, I i can talk about that's the area of my knowledge Writing, unfortunately, has become torture on children. It's another word for torture because we don't understand what writing involves. And so um, we have made, you know, we've taken the joy out of writing because we give this whole copy book and say, now this is letter A. This is the way it is formed. Now write that 10 times, write that 20 times. Now tell me where is the joy in that? Okay. Um, same thing, instead of doing that, can we do role play and writing? Let's set up a restaurant, okay? And so the, uh, the children are playing, uh, uh, you know, being a, either a chef or the manager at the restaurant, or they could be even the customer at a restaurant. This is a very meaningful experience because most children would have gone to restaurants, right? They understand what it looks like. So when we are playing, can we ask children to write the menu? And can we get children to read the menu? Writing and reading is happening here. At home, can you make a grocery list? When you're making your grocery list, can you get your child to help you? Right? So when writing becomes meaningful and in context, children will have more joy with it. Can we do role play for writing? It doesn't matter if they don't get the formation correct. It doesn't matter if they haven't got the speed of writing. If the and is not okay it's fine as long as there is play in it because we have time to set all those things right by the time the children are six years old they have enough conceptual development that writing will automatically come you, you don't need to force children to write before the age of six it has to be ingrained in the way they are learning in the way they are playing right Okay, what about numeracy? This is all fine, but what do we do about math? How are we going to teach children numbers? Have you seen our ancestors, I feel, had a lot of wisdom, you know? Um, they used to play with the four shells. I don't know, we, we call it the gatta bara, uh, and, and it's the modern version, it's called Ludo. So there is uh, the ashta chammas and the gatta baras and all of that that we used to play. I don't know if you're all playing those with children anymore, but you should be. Uh, you know, using these for playing with children because these are math that's happening. The minute I put the four shells, I have to count how many have turned upside and how many have count, turned downside. I need to learn how many numbers I have to move my pawn, right? Or you play with dice, get children to recognize the numbers on dice. Addition is happening. If you're playing uh, snakes and ladders, you know, subtraction is happening. So numbers will come naturally when we are playing. You don't need to specially have uh, activities planned around writing and reading a num of numbers. I've seen a lot of parents, in fact, they will say with a lot of pride that my three-year-old can recite numbers from one to hundred. Fantastic. But do they know what hundred means? They will Start of saying 20, 30, 40. The minute you say, can you pick up and give me five chalk piece? They will pick up 
10 and they will say that those are 5. That's this being able to recite to 100 mean that children know their numbers? No. It means that children know how to recite those numbers, which is like singing a song. If today you play a Malayalam song and because I'm not a Malayali, I'm saying, and you play it for 10 times, I will learn to sing the song, but I will not know what it means. It's the same with children learning to recite numbers. It's not meaningful at all for them, right? So playing games which involve mathematical concepts is important for children. So math cannot be taught through the book first. Math learning is, when you look at how math is learned, it's from concrete to abstract. Right? It means that I need to use my hands to learn math. If you're telling me circle, I need to feel a circle. If you're telling me square, I need to know what a square feels like. So it has to be concrete. Only then it can go into abstract, which is me drawing a square or a circle in a paper. You understand? So these are some of the ideas for how play and academics can be married together. Right? I'm just going to take a quick time check. We It's about 5.11. Um, Usha, can we stretch till about 5.20? Yes, you can, you can. Okay. So, um, there are a lot of questions also, which people are waiting to ask. I've been on phone calls, so you can. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so, where were we? We've spoken about how play can be married to academics. It's only a matter of us keeping in mind the five principles that we saw earlier, that it should be joyful, it should be meaningful, it should be socially interactive, it should be active engagement, and it has to be iterative. So if you keep these five things in mind and plan your activities, automatically children will love it, they will enjoy it, and they will want to do more of those, right? Okay. What next? Okay, so this is another game that we will play. I hope uh, you can see my screen now. Um, you can turn on your cameras if you want so that I can also see all your beautiful faces. Um, if you see, this is a paperclip. How many of you have seen a paperclip before or have not seen a paperclip before? Um, the basic purpose of a paperclip is to hold papers together. Right? You put clip a few papers and you clip it together. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to do. We are going to count to 30 seconds. And I want you to think of all the different ways that this paper clip can be used. Are you all ready? All the different ways that this paper clip can be used. On your mark, get set, go. Your 30 seconds starts now. What are the ways in which a paper clip can be used? You want to make a note of it, think of it just in your mind, but just go ahead. 30 seconds is all we have. Okay, you have another five seconds and stop. Okay, anybody would like to share with me, please you can unmute yourself at this point. Uh, did you come up with about six uses? Anybody who came up with six uses? Five, we have five. How many of you had five uses? You can unmute yourself and you can talk. Four, how many of you had four uses? It's me, ma'am. Four uses, okay. Uh, uh, as per my knowledge, I'm telling, I can use it for rubber band hanger. Wait, wait, I'll, wait, wait, I'll come back to you about what you used it for. I just want to understand how many of you thought of three uses, three, at least three uses. No? And uh, two, one? Yes, sir. Yes. One at least you should have, no? Come on. Yes, I only told that it's used for pinning papers together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, 
can you share now you can share please what are the uses that you uh, came up with yes ma'am i use it for rubber band hanger as my daughter she always keeps all the rubber bands away so i use it for rubber band hanger very nice and, uh, one by one and i use it to make her a round hair band a round hair band with colorful rubber bands okay and i use it for papers to stick okay. the papers and i i use to make her a bracelet to her hand okay. fabulous so you've used it for jewelry you've used it for headgear and you've used it for the purpose it's made which is to clip papers yeah. together you've yeah. got four uses yeah fantastic anybody else who would like to share what uses you thought of uh for children uh, we play with it uh, as a magnetic uh, okay you know game uh, it, uh, it can be for color sorting we have used it for a little older children in the sense at least the ones who don't put in the mouth right And, okay uh, say for a ukg child you would say okay you can uh, use it as if it you know to open it or whatever uh, however you want to use it uh, with a little uh, note saying okay don't hurt yourself and um, uh, arrange it the way you like like uh, how we give them for um, you know shapes uh, so what do you call that uh, uh, pattern make a pattern uh, patterns okay so that this is for the children in the in the classroom what you've thought of yes yes you thought for adults what you uh, did you think of any uses for adults uh no it's the uh, same in that sense jewelry making it a bracelet is what i have done and uh, using it for anything which needs to be kept in place whatever it is okay so organizing something jewelry again very nice anybody else who had some unique thoughts thank you for sharing thank you so much anybody else who had unique thoughts on what you could use a paper clip for uh maybe ma'am uh i have one thought i'll i'll unbox everything and i'll ask my kid to put it back just to test their patience because these kids are very very impatient these days and that is that becomes a uh, really tiring so i'm going to say whoever uh, wins the game i'm going to say okay. he, he gets a chocolate so you put everything out and then you put everything yeah, back yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah in the same box okay super all right um super so what i'm seeing as a trend today as well as before this thank you thank you all for sharing first of all um i've seen is that in about 30 seconds usually typically the average number of people the average users that they come up with is about 3 right slightly um uh, you know more creative people come up with 5 to 6 uses and uh, when i say slightly more creative people i mean early childhood educators because we are very creative people i mean we think of these 100 ways that a thing can be used but anyway more creative people come up with about 6 uses do you know the average among children for the same exercise that was done um research shows that an average uh, a 10 year old on average is able to come up with a minimum of 70 anything between 70 to 80 uses for the same paper clip and it's shocking because what happened between being a 10 year old to being a 30 40 year old you know our creativity just died it's just come down so much because these children were able to make amazing brilliant creations in their mind of course in all uh, uh, fairness they were given a little bit more time i gave you only 30 seconds they were given a little bit more time to come up with the uses one very creative use that um, i had heard on one of the sessions before is that the wife said i open it up and i use it to wake my husband i poke him <laughs> and so she said that and <laughs> anyway that's her creativity um what i tried to do with this exercise is try to get you thinking right now we all know that creativity is an important aspect in today's world in the world when the classroom has flipped today when we are sitting at home and doing a lot of learning in a world where information is at the fingertips for a child right they just have to google it google has become a verb it's not a brand or a, a name of a company it's a verb now that to look up is to google right information is there for them so 
in this day and age, it's important that we ensure that children retain their creativity. And how can you ensure that children's creativity is retained? Now, creativity is also linked to a, quite a few of the other higher order thinking skills, right? I want you to put your hand on your forehead. Put your hand on your forehead. Okay, if you do this right behind your hand, the part of the brain there is called the prefrontal cortex, right? Think, feel that part of the brain. Now, when you do this, you can feel this and you should be really proud because this prefrontal cortex, thank you for putting your hand, this prefrontal cortex is there only in us, that is human beings. We have evolved with this part of the brain, right? Monkeys don't have it. Other animals don't have it. Monkeys have the frontal cortex. We have the prefrontal cortex. And that part is responsible for all learning. It's all responsible for reasoning, thinking, critical analysis, right? So if this part of the brain has to be developed, this is the last part that gets developed when the brain is being built, okay? So think of it that this is the basic brain that is your nerve stem that is the part of the brain that is developed most primitively right this is there even in reptiles this is the part which will tell you if there is something too hot it will make your body jerk back right that's the primitive part of the brain on top of it is built your limbic system which is your response to any threats right on top of it is your thinking part of the brain built and this part in the front is built the last that is the last thing to grow and so that is the part that we all as parents and educators we need to help the child to develop and this part develops through use through allowing the child to think critically to reason to problem solve right so um I'm going to ask you a few questions. Let's see if any of you have answers here. So please unmute yourself. This doesn't need me to see your video, but I just need to hear your answers. If you do know the answer, yes. He's asking here, is, is there any particular kit available in market to execute on for the, the suggested activities with instructions, any suggestions? Wow, okay. Um, so you're asking me if there is a kit for uh, for the play activities, uh, what activities do you want to get for? There is a kit actually. So Abhishek Singh has asked this question. Is, okay. there, is there any particular kit available in market to execute on for the suggested activities with instructions? He's talking about the play. Okay, so there is only one kit available which will suit every situation. It's called our brain. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I know that we do require a lot of help. I, I don't have an answer right away. I can be maybe look it up and come back with a few links that you can use. Um, immediately top of the mind response is you can look at Lego Foundation's work in play because they've done fantastic work. So you can look at uh, the Lego Foundation and Lego in education. Uh, I am a big fan of uh, the Lego blocks. So I I do recommend that you take a look at their site, right? Um, and I think that a lot of people have uh, uh, given the options or whatever they can use the paper clip for. And I think they couldn't talk because I think- uh, They were on Facebook. Sheetal JT says keychain, clipping open packets, then uh, zip handle, then Madhuri Anand says uh, six uses of paper clip. Keyboard Ready? thing, sari pin, uh, then phone reset, phone stand, <laughs> And bookmark. Very nice. See, these are all super creative people. Yeah, Very nice. And we couldn't get them on to talk. That's all right. So what I will do, I will go through your comments once again after the session is over on Facebook. So maybe individually we can answer these. Uh, uh, and I'd like to see how you creative all of you are. And there's a question for you also. Yes. Thank you so much, Miss Preeti, ma'am. Beautifully explained the importance of playing childhood. It was plenty of information for me. How can I help my child overcome failure to while playing games? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because there's a video that I... Atika Moen. 
uh, right, Atikamoin. Uh, okay, I'm going to play a video and I want you to see that video. But before we address the part about overcoming failure, I just want to show you one screen which is about the kind of questions you should be asking children. Now, uh, typically parents and educators are flummoxed. They don't know what to ask children questions, right? Uh, I have seen that parents, when they're picking up children after school, um, khaya? have you finished your dabba? Did you eat your snack? And did you do so? Did you take care of your pants? Did you take care of your objects? So these are some of the questions that are coming from parents. We don't know the right questions to ask. So I'm just going to put up this slide and I want you to look at this because this is again based on uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which I know you will be having one more session next week, Usha. Uh, so I'm not going to touch too much upon Bloom's taxonomy, but yes. I want you to look at the questions here. So there are six levels of questioning that you can have with children, starting from knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So what are some of the questions just for if it is just for knowledge this is something let me tell you which is available even with google the questions will be who what where when how describe this or what is this is just for identification or fill in the blanks kind of things right if you want to understand how much the child's comprehension of that particular thing is you will ask questions like what do you think is the main idea behind this what is the difference that is there between these two things, right? So this will give you an understanding of their comprehension of that particular concept. Application, you will say, how is this an example of dash? How is say fingers related to toes? That is application, right? So um, the next step would be analysis. What are the parts of features of classify this, etc. Then we have synthesis. What would you predict or infer from this? What ideas can you add to this? And finally, evaluation. Do you agree that this is correct? What do you think about Dash? Right? So these are all ways that you should be questioning children. Do not ask them questions which are close-ended, which are just one word like, okay, uh, what is the color of the apple? Red. Green, maximum a child would have seen a green apple, but that's it, that is so close-ended. Instead, if we are looking at this, this is only the first level, which is knowledge. What can I ask? Why is an apple red in the, on the outside and white on the inside? Can we ask deeper questions, please? I remember in one of the classrooms in my uh, schools, I remember this incident and I like to tell you the story. Um, there was a child when the teacher asked, what is the color of the sky? She asked, at what time? And that was just brilliant because it showed that this child had and then just patak give blue as the answer. It wasn't rote learning. It was the child was thinking that, oh my God, when it's cloudy, it's gray. Otherwise it's sunny, it's, you know, blue. Or the child was able to understand at what time. When she asked that, I mean, this is an example I, I love giving again and again. So I know that we are running a bit short time. So I'm going to quickly move forward. Uh, Ushai, with your permission, I'd like to share this with you if you don't mind sharing it with everybody later. The critical thinking questions. You can just share that with everybody later on. Um, this is a video that I'd like to play for all of you. We are going to discuss a little bit about the video once you've watched it. I hope the audio of it comes through. I just forwarded a bit so that you could all just watch it quickly. The idea is the child has to fix this car in place and push himself off the ramp.
so the teacher is intentionally putting things up on the ramp so that the child will move it right How many of you would have jumped in to help now? I'm so sorry. Has the child been at this? The child has been going back and forth, back and forth. Oh my god, the child fell down. How many of you would have stepped in to help now? for help. girl thinks it's a game and she joins in. And like all boys, he gets distracted by a girl. But he comes back.
can hear the teacher ask him, Jack, do you need some help? Jack, you need some help? So sorry, once again, I don't know why this is happening. Good job, Jack. See, you found it. You knew. That is learning. enjoyed watching little Jack on his lady ride on. Um, so that was Jack who's about 18 months old, one and a half years. Finally, he was able to get his ride on, fix it in place and just ride off. And, and um, I know that each time I watch this, there's a sense of joy and achievement at the end of it that I feel uh, whenever I see this. And trust me, I've seen it a lot of times. So uh, please unmute yourself because I want to hear what your thoughts were about. Yeah, this. There is a question from Bhargavi K. Preeti okay. says, how do we ensure learn through play in higher grades? Ah, okay. So I'll come back to that. Actually, after this. You can actually combine the question with Miss um, um, Priyanka. She has a question. And she can put it up online. Principal of CC, the Bangal School. I can see you raise your hand. Can you come online and ask a question so she can combine both the questions together? Yeah, sure. Before that, we'll just talk about the video for two minutes because it, uh, it's uh, in relation to what Atika had asked about uh, failure and uh, learning about failure, right? So this video I play to show that number one, we as adults need to have patience to allow children to oh, hi. face hi, their own challenges. Hi, uh, uh, hi, hi, who's this? Who's this? Okay, somebody said hi. We'll come back to that. So what I was saying is this particular video shows that if we allow children to overcome their challenges, the learning that they get from it is tremendous. So are we giving children uh, hi, enough Priyanka chances? Here. Priyanka, am I audible I to see you? you Priyanka. Welcome back to that. So what I was saying is... Priyanka, we are not able to see you. What we'll do is... Uh, uh, we'll take your question. You post your question on the Zoom group chat and probably Preeti can take it up after this. You can see you, Preeti. Okay. Yes, yeah, so can I ask my question, please? I think there's a bit of lag in the communication. Okay, uh, just a second. Preeti yeah. finished what she was talking. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, I have actually... Yes, I have posted my question. Super, I'll take a look at it, Priyanka. Uh, so I was saying about this video, you need to allow children to experience challenge. You need to ensure that they have 
problems which they are able to solve. So at home, can you create certain challenges? I've seen uh, small examples uh, like, can you allow children to set the table? So doing uh, chores every day, that is life skills. You should allow them to work with you at home, especially during the quarantine. These are the learnings that will help them continue lifelong. Uh, when it comes to failure, this is Atika's question. Um, children will learn to fail if we celebrate failures. They will learn to understand that failure is okay. I only learned from it and I will move on. The minute we are celebrating only the end result and not the journey is when children will be scared of failure. So when you are appreciating children for the efforts that they are putting in, they will not mind failing at the end because they know that you have understood they have put the effort in, right? So failure is, they're scared of failure only if the end result is being celebrated. So you need to celebrate the entire process of the learning of the play that has happened. So Atika, I hope I've answered your question. Um, and somebody and asked you that, how do we ensure learn through play in higher grades? In higher grades, I'm so glad you asked that question. If you look at the national education policy, um, the one that has been drafted here just now, which is now being uh, considered for publishing, um, the national education policy for the first time in this country has addressed, and even the word play has featured in it prominently. So I'm really excited about that. And secondly, early childhood has come into uh, the national education policy in the purview of education department. But what is more interesting is they talk about how play is the pedagogy for early childhood. But when it comes to primary and secondary grades, they talk about interdisciplinary learning, right? And multisensorial learning being important. Now play, the way it looks in early childhood starts looking a lot more structured by the time it comes to primary and second grades. Um, there's one saying that I love and I think that we should all blow this up and put it up in our, uh, wherever we can see it prominently. Children learn best on their feet and not on their seat. The minute parents and teachers understand this, education will look a lot different, right? So in primary and secondary grades, what does play look like? It looks a lot like hands-on learning. It means that if I'm learning about say the concept of sound, right? I have to learn it from a geographical point of view. I have to learn that echo happens when there is a cave and when so-and-so thing permits. So that's geography. I learn about, uh, say, um, ultrasound machine, which is biology, which is when we are talking about how to see the density of the body, which is being, um, uh, you know, scanned through the ultrasound machine. I have to learn about sound from the perspective of music how it appeals to different people in different ways. So when I'm learning about sound holistically and not just in my physics classroom or not just in my chemistry or geography classroom, that's how play looks as you're growing older. It's allowing children to experiment with those concepts and understand it holistically rather than breaking it into just watertight compartments of this is math, this is science. Because Life is not like that. The minute you come out of school, it's not going to be, you know, watertight compartments. It is going to be holistic. And this is the same kind of learning that will have to happen in primary and secondary grades also. So that is something that play will transition to as you grow older. So I hope I've answered that question. Uh, Priyanka, has she posted her question? I know she really wanted to ask me something. Yes. Okay, Priyanka, would you like to unmute yourself now and ask me the question you wanted? Priyanka, you can unmute and ask. We can't even see your video. Are you there? Let me check. If there are any other questions, I'm at the end of my presentation. I have, uh, of course, I have a lot to say about play, but I think we are running out People of time. People saying that it's a very informative session. And... Um, Yes, am I audible to you now? Yes, we are. You are audible. Yes, you can ask. Okay. So, hi, Preeti. So, the just let me go straight to the question. Otherwise, again, you know, we'll end up in some issues. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 
the question is uh, like normally in Finland, you know, play and joy has been given a lot of importance and is an inter integral part of school days. So yes. how we can do the same as a part of our school education, given the time constraint and a parent's emphasis, reading and writing. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> I know. So um, I think this is a big challenge for all of us because uh, from the last 70, 80 years, we've all been told that schooling has to be in a particular format that means that there are results at the end of each year and and uh, you know our grades and our this one are reflected on how we do the in that particular exam so i feel that given our time constraints we need to figure out how can we combine subjects combine uh, uh, you know, uh, the same concept that's being addressed in different subjects, like I said, have interdisciplinary learning, have more time allocated to projects. So the minute your curriculum becomes project based, you will be able to see that the outcomes can also be linked to those projects and children will learn as much as they're interested in sometimes even more than the grade that you would have set. Right. So I think interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary learning and project based learning are two things that I can say will help schools um, transition from a completely academic setting into a play based um, uh, program. I um, I'm almost running out of my battery. So unfortunately, I'm not close to a power source. Um, this is the best spot for in network. So I'm not able to move. And so any other questions, please post it on Facebook yes. so I can answer it later on. And I'm sure that uh, Usha will also forward these. It's to been me, a so very I lovely session with 140 participants totally. And a um, and lot of people have posted questions and probably you can write uh, in the mail to her and she can write an email ID on the Facebook uh, 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 comment box. Uh, we will post it there. So you can post it, the questions directly to Preeti Vikram. I think Preeti has been a wonderful session with you and the play has been, uh, hello. I'm putting up my credentials, which is uh, yes. my phone number and my email ID, if anybody would like to read. Uh, Preeti at the life in India.com. And her phone number is also there. If anybody would like to ask any questions, I'm always available. Uh, we can continue answering questions till my battery doesn't give up. So go for it. Again, Dinesh says, thank you for the lovely session. I must say you've been a lovely audience, all of you. And um, the session has been wonderful, Ms. Preeti. And uh, all the questions have been almost addressed uh, because you already shown a lot of activities and a lot of videos and stuff like that, which answers, which has got an answer in itself. And I think your, your question has also been answered. So I think play plays a very integral part and we should make time for play. Rather, play should be integrated as a part of STEAM, uh, whatever we are doing. Absolutely. And most importantly, please play as adults. That's my parting thoughts, that uh, if you haven't been playing enough in your own life, you will never bring it into the life of a child. So you have to play for your own sanity, for your spouse's sanity and your in-laws and everybody else that you are living with play together to live together happily. So that's, that's my parting words. So this is the essence of the entire thing. <laughs> Thank you so much for the lovely time, which we had with you and uh, a lovely session. Don't you agree with uh, uh, her? I mean, her, she also enjoyed the session and we also enjoyed the session with her. Been lovely. Thank you. you. Been lovely audience asking a lot of questions. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Talk about the workshop. Talk about the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So, thank you so much. We have a workshop coming up on 19th of May and a series of workshops which is coming up. And we also have Ms. Swati Popitwats, who is going to be addressing all of them on 31st of May, the platform being AdSense. So, see you soon, very soon, with all these uh, celebrity figures as Preeti Vikram is also an expert in early childhood. I'm not an expert in early childhood. I'm a K-12 expert. So I do like to always interact with a, with, a, with, a, with a preschool expert and they've got lots and lots of things to share with us. 
So see you again, Preeti, sometime later on the panel back again. So till the time, thank you so much. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.